Okay, so the new league seasons are going to start in a couple of weeks' time. The hurling and the football starting the weekends of May 8th, 9th, and then the following weekend as well. I'm joined by Michael Verney of the Irish Independent and Phil Lanigan of the Mail to talk about that. And even the uh, the focus on players in recent weeks, you know, when the Dublin players that they were caught. And look, it was great journalism. I kind of said this at the time. Uh, you know, it was in the Irish Indo, Frank Roach did the story, it was great, you know, you have these pictures, you have the story, you have the big names, the whole lot, and makes a splash. Now, I didn't feel that there was public outrage of it, I thought that there was simply mass coverage, and then obviously we saw what came out with Monaghan as well. Phil, what were your thoughts on, do you feel that there was public a public outcry, or do you think there was mass coverage? Do you think people are genuinely upset when most understand that outdoor activities are safe and the restrictions are over the top? Yeah, look, Shane, there's, there's plenty of elements and layers to the story. And I, I guess I don't think you can argue with the news values as a journalist. That's a scoop. Um, the nature of the pandemic has put such a focus on restrictions that if I think if you, you don't understand news values, if you, if you don't see why, maybe that would have made front and back page. But just, to, I must say, I found the whole affair a bit depressing, just from a sporting point of view. The bigger picture in that, you know, written about the fact that the elite exemption being taken away was such an insult to inter-county players. Like the, the government were perfectly happy to use the players um, as a political flag of convenience during the winter at a time when, you know, COVID rates were roughly the same as they were at the moment, but heading into the worst peak season in a, for a health service um, in any given year. And, the, you know, the government made no bones about using the players as a symbol of the country fighting the virus. Um, a lot of players had genuine concerns and went through all that process. And across the board, um, senior inter-county, Camogie, ladies football, all of those trophies were presented in Crow Park in December, you know, at a, at a real time of worry and concern, even for the country. And then you had, the, you know, the disgrace of the government just with, withdrawing the elite um, exemption just like that and then hiding behind this farce of of claiming it was it was gone all along and should the ga have done more but like you know 10 days or so after after the salmon Park cup was lifted you know the players were no longer deemed elite so and that as you know partly led to the situation where players who would have been training um say at inish fails or any ga club with proper health and safety protocols, if they were elite status, then in a full squad, in a tightly controlled and um, highly organised manner, um, ended up in you know in a, in a pitch, uh, scrambling around a month out from summer when clearly they were going to be deemed elite. So I think like the that element too is is it's just you know depressing from how the government have kind of handled sport and approached sport and led to a situation where there's been effective criminalization of, of amateur elite athletes with guard investigations. And then clearly of the, the second layer that, you know, the, the, the inter-county scene has kind of been out of control and lost perspective for years now. And we've kind of written and talked about this before. And unfortunately, the county teams prepared to break public health guidelines is, is absolutely the wrong thing to do. And understandably, the level of frustration and anger arose from that. But... Like I said, maybe I think to, to, to reach, to understand why we've come to this point, um, you have to kind of look at maybe how we've treated our elite athletes and even sport and physical activity in this country, as I think both of you have spoken before about, um, right down to youth sport and the abandonment of kind of the next generation. Mm. Michael, what was your thoughts on the, on the story? Uh, yeah, sure, listen, it's I, I do think it was front page news in the sense that you have... Like to put the plain facts on the table, you have you know the greatest team in GA history. Um, you know we don't agree. We don't. A lot of us don't agree with the rules and don't agree that they, they agree that they should be allowed to train. But at the moment, inter county teams are not allowed to train. You had uh, a you know a fairly high profile group from you know the best team the GA has ever seen flouting those rules. Uh, a lot of people would ask, you know, if they're setting that sort of an example to everybody else then you know what hope is there for anybody if you know beacons of you know sport are setting this example it's like I, I you know i understand that i but I, I don't like teams should be allowed to be back training but but they're not um you know people will say you know 
did you you know did you go and did you go and check in other counties whether this is going on or you know basically you know it's a it's a tip off essentially you follow the tip off they were training there if people have information and if they give Phil or you or me information that a county is training are you going to go and follow it up 100 percent you're going to go and follow it up that's that that's your job that was followed up it just it was just it was very it was a very high profile breach no more than the Monaghan stuff. The Monaghan stuff was particularly damning now, in, in, in my view. Uh, the, the, obviously, the, the pictures maybe weren't as good, but this was a full-scale training session. Uh, there was guys on, on the gate basically doing security to stop people getting access to the ground. But uh, there, was obviously, there was obviously a whistle, whistleblower there who took, took photos. Um, it, it happened, I think, a couple of days before the Dublin breach as well. To me, that was a that was a, a much a much worse thing to do. They're all there. Uh, they're all in their gear. There's there's no hiding of it. By all accounts, you know, one of, one of the coaches would have potentially had to travel 150 kilometers one way to take the session. To me, that's an awful lot worse. Like I I agree with you, Shane. That like they should be allowed to train and all that, but they're not allowed to train and to to openly flaunt the flaunt the rules to the extent of where you have 40 cars. Coming into Cardiff GAA, or you know, ten or twelve cars coming to, into Inish Vales, regardless of whether it's at seven in the morning or seven in the evening, is 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 still wrong. Do I think intercounty teams should be allowed to train? Yes, I do, one hundred percent, I do. But unfortunately, they're not. Um, that was, as Phil said, that was a lot to do with. You know, they had elite status. I wonder, did the GAA? How hard did the GAA plug? To keep that elite status, or were were they ha- were they happy enough to sit back maybe with the with the notion of hopefully if it if things if intercounty is coming back a bit later that they'll have people in grounds and that the you know the financial coffers will be boosted an awful lot more as a result of that because if they played games in you know February March April uh, May even they won't be able to have anybody there was there something to that of you know of that nature to it possibly um, they were big they were big stories they were big high profile breaches yes we've heard of X Y and Z training but to actually physically have footage of Monaghan training on of Dublin training. Um it it is it is it is quite that da- it is quite damning. But listen, I understand I understand anybody that would say sure just let the, they should be able to be out training and, and they should, but unfortunately they're not. So they are still flouting rules that are there. And if these role models in society are flouting rules, then like you know a lot of, that would just make everybody think that they can flout the rules if everybody flouts the rules then we we, we probably have a big problem on our hands mm. there's a couple of things at play here i think number one in so i'm not encouraging anyone to break rules and sometimes that i tweet do people think outdoor activities are safe you have people getting triggered over the idea that i'm saying break restrictions i'm obviously not i mean you obviously just have to think about what i'm saying um but like, number one, it does draw attention to the crazy restrictions that are in place. So I think that's good because it brings it more into the public realm. Um, when you look at the team's training and then all of a sudden these 12-week bans that are self-imposed, I think it's kind of laughable and, you know, you know, it was an error of judgment and all this kind of statement being put out there. I mean, it's laughable. Just, you know, just fess up to it. Look, I broke the rules. I thought I was above the rules and I got caught. And I'm going to take a ban. You know, let, don't try and make yourself seem like you just kind of didn't really realize it was for you or, or it was some error of judgment. The other thing is, obviously, sanctions had to come when Cork and Down had been sanctioned previously. So I, th- I think I accept that too. But just to jump back to the whole, is it public outrage thing, Phil? And take this any, any which way you want. Take the conversation in another direction if you like as well. But do you think there's actual public outrage from people or mass coverage? And again... It is newsworthy stuff, so I get that it was going to be covered left, right, and centre. But do you think people are actually angry over it? There are some, like, but do you think that it's, a, it's public outrage across the board? Look, I wouldn't like to speak for the the people of Ireland, then, but you can ju- look just judging judging online, which is probably an unfair reflection of of society as well. Um, you could see there's a level of anger and outrage, and I think. You know, understandably so, people are suffering in so many different ways. They're, you know, whether that's their job or business and every and anything. So even if, like, I think we all agree that we we think that outdoor sport is is one of the low risk activities. That there is that principle of what everyone else and what the country are suffering. So I, I don't think you can really defend it on on that basis. It's just maybe again, how do we get to this point, and what would have stopped it? Like, I think you always have to look at the. The bigger picture, you know, what sanctions would have stopped this? Like the 
the GA, you know, the, the word was going around even last summer of, of teams training. It took a, a number of high profile interventions. I know Michael Dygan spoke publicly as chairman and kind of really put a focus on it. The GA then um, actually acted publicly themselves and to protect the clubs and to stop this. But in terms of the second time around, like the, the, pen, the punishments and the penalties there, clearly um, counties didn't see any <laughs> them working or having any effect because they looked at Cork and Down and went, OK, we'll take our chances. The punishment clearly um, wasn't enough of a deterrent. So I heard Anthony Daly speak in RT Sport last weekend and said, you know, um, that the counties, maybe if you'd looked at from the start, threatening counties um, to turf them out of the National League um, or even championship going into the Winter Championship last year, if you had from the top down very strong governance, very strong leadership, I think that would have helped. And look, at what he, you know, again, for the weekend, looking at where does the, the Gaelic Players Association fit in fit into this. This is a player welfare issue from the start. Um, there's been very little public leadership. Um, I would have thought they needed strong leadership there to protect their own members, to protect the reputations of the, the elite players, of all of their members. And we've reached a stage where a lot of the reputations of their members and of the GA as a whole and of the inter-county body as a whole has been damaged. And I think, again, there's been a failure you know, of, of leadership there um, and from the GA, like I say, with the punishments. Could they actually have did this? We've long had a GA mentality of just outlaw and go against the rules and we all, we all turn a blind eye. But if the GA had taken a stronger lead with stronger punishment, as Anthony Daly suggested, maybe we wouldn't have ended up here. You have that, to maybe? ask just on that chain as well. Like, do, like, what the point? What's the deterrent? Is the deterrent strong enough? If it's expulsion, is that going to stop people from doing it? To be honest, I like. I think you'd be stupid to do it if if there's a possibility that you're going to be turfed out of a competition. So, like, I I kind of thought the um. I kind of thought the, the Dublin suspension uh, of Desi Farrell was kind of nearly s- smart in a way because they're trying to take their own their own action and trying to maybe uh, avoid a uh, sanction from Crow Park. Uh, Monaghan, like, doing the exact same, I thought was kind of comical in a way. It was just like, here's the Dublin model. We'll, we'll follow this. Interesting to see, will there be anything else from Crow Park on this? Will there be, uh, like, will they, will they bump up the sanction? Will there be, obviously, you know, there's... A, the, the thing with league games and you know losing home advantage will there be anything more than that maybe there maybe there won't be but um yeah it's just just it's all to do with what's the punishment for for your you know crime whether it's a crime or not is another story but what's the punishment or what is the deterrent if it's not strong enough uh, a lot of people are just going to be willing to take it to get that advantage and to get that advantage that every inter-county team seems to crave now and it's all like over the last couple of months i guarantee you Every county was hearing, you know, X, Y, and Z are training, and there's this paranoia amongst count amongst county squads now that they're missing out and that they're, you know, been left behind or whatever. And it's almost there's a commentary there. Um, it's not out there in the public, but there's definitely a commentary there. Say, you know, you even hear, see it in kind of WhatsApps and social media commentary that you know that you're actually foolish not to be back training that you're actually like what are you doing you're like you're getting left miles behind so everyone else is breaking the rules why aren't you doing it and it's that kind of it is that kind of paranoia of the inter-county kind of runaway train it's yet another example of it really and do you not do you not think Michael or Shane, that again the strong punishment like imagine a team going into it all the football teams will tell you that the national league um, has a huge status so imagine that you were kicked out of the league, then you're automatically demoted. Um, if that's if that's the case, like the the, the impact that would have, the risk reward there, like Mike says, I would have thought that's just an immediate deterrent. You'd want to be half mad to kind of to risk um, a number of training sessions, collective training sessions, with that punishment. But kind of the, the GA is, it's always at times been a bit too softly, softly. Phil, where do you think the voices are? And you have been a voice looking for for you know. Kids to be coming back playing from a long time back, um, the likes of golf, tennis, stuff like this. Where do you think the voices are out there from within the GEA? To, like, you know, a lot of people do realise that outdoor activities are safe. Why aren't there voices from within the GEA, from GEA people, from people with big in- influence, calling for this to come back? Because it just seems like we've got consensus media where everything was shut down and any opposing view was called conspiracy theories. 
Where are the voices? Well, well look, there, there have been different voices, and um, in Sunday's paper, a big interview with a very, uh, very influential and very significant voice um, on a load of these issues and with a, with a number of interesting angles to it as well. Um, um, but the likes of, look at the letter that was signed. Um, Aidan O'Rourke was one of the leading voices there. He's sports performance manager, um, All Ireland with Queen's um, University. All Ireland winner with with Armagh. There was a, a letter to the Stormont and the Northern Ireland executive, which was signed by over fifty, I think, more in close approaching a hundred top sports figures from across the board, across the codes, whether you know different sports, well, well outside Gaelic games, all on this issue and all pushing the youth sport agenda, not not the elite sport agenda. So there have been voices there, um, and to different degrees. Um, again other voices within the GA community. But unfortunately, the problem, as we all know, Shane, is that uh, with the pandemic, finances are in a bind and that the GA at the top level um, were basically needed 15 million for the championship to progress. And the government know, um, and unfortunately, um, as the Federation of Irish Sports, I think I heard Mary O'Connor say, all the sporting organisations are basically in a kind of, it's not blackmail, but in a, a financial bind where their very existence to playing these competitions is dependent on government funding. So how do you, it's it's harder, it makes it harder. I, don't, I think you're right in that there should be more voices and that you, you have to be strong enough in your convictions to say the right thing is the right thing to do, irrespective of whether you might threaten government funding. But I think that's there in the background all the time. But it's a good the, to take, the, take this the wrong way and kind of say, here you are publicly criticising government policy, government approach. Um, Right, we're not going to give you 15 million. We're going to leave you in your 34 million financial hole um, with the GA and go figure it out yourselves, lads. So, like, <clears throat> clearly, that's a, that's a tricky one. That's a, a, a tricky argument to, to to dance along. But like, I think you're right. You know, if it's the right thing to do, you got to be strong. On it. But to, but to me, that's almost acting as if the GA isn't of massive benefit to the government. Like, I I think the GA does, has a lot of power here because. Imagine the outcry if the GA said the government is refusing to fund us. And I think that there's a huge power for the GA. The government because... just say, look, we, do, we don't. Like, there's plenty of other, we're all involved in sport, but there's plenty of other sectors of society who need money and financial prop up. Um, and just as much, or obviously huge. far more businesses. So the government can easily kind of say, sorry, the pot isn't as big. And quietly say the pot isn't as big while taking the fact that the, they were, they were criticised publicly, so that that is tricky. They would have every justification to to, to cut things back, and mm. um, so that unfortunately, I think every every sporting organisation which is struggling financially, no more than every, I think, <laughs> nearly every business organisation, unless maybe your Amazon or one of the billionaires that have increased their wealth, um, and she'll buy. But that requires strong leadership and the youth sport should have had a lot of stronger voices from the very top. And I think it really only took Larry McCarthy's inaugura inauguration speech as, as new GA president to, to really push that agenda when I think there's a strong argument, as the likes of Aidan O'Rourke have rested, that youth sport shouldn't have really stopped um, all along or certainly you know should have been back far quicker. Hmm. Michael, any fa final thoughts on that? No, Asher. Listen, I I think we've 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 probably said it all. The big thing is we just everyone just just mad to be back from a journalist's point of view, from a spectator's point of view, from like what did I say to you? And we've all had just the conversation last October, November. Like it kept us going, like and it will keep us going again when when it kicks back up, even if we even if we can't be there. So I think the underlying thing is we want Ken's back and we want them back as soon as possible and just even knowing knowing that they're going to be back you know I would say May 8th onwards is um, it is it just gives you a new lease of life and Phil myself and Michael already talked about trying to keep yourself motivated coming back playing this um, for the new season whenever it happens you're still hurling away there hoping to have a full forward line with your two young lads <laughs> We'll see, we'll see. I think it's the... Um, I got a chance last year to, to play with my eldest who kind of moved from juvenile to adult grade and we'd, we'd actually break crack until the pandemic struck and I'm not sure if, uh, if COVID might retire us but the, the second the second uh, young fella actually is turned adult this year so there's a, there's a very slim chance of a, 
of a, of a all Lanigan full forward line, maybe junior B at some stage, even for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. All right, thanks very much, Michael Verney of the Irish Indo and uh, Phil Lanigan of the Mail. Cheers, Thanks, lad.